Hello, Sterling. Thank you for having me in your home today. It's a warm August summer day, and we're inside in your, in your home. And this is our third interview together at this time. And this comes about as uh, we have had opportunity to see each other after the last interview and talk a bit. And there's a little more information from what I understand that you could offer in this interview. And I was thinking, what if we start out today with how you came about into the world mm, almost 104 years ago now, right? If you could tell a little of that story. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try to outline some of the high points and things that have happened along the way. And if we go back to uh, 1911, that was, that was a good year, 1911. Yeah. My father and mother drove from Fitchburg, Mass. to Boxboro, Mass. to go to their father's farm on Christmas Day, celebrate mm -hmm. Christmas. And uh, they, they made the trip in a Susan Robart automobile, which I never knew existed, but, but I don't know how he bought it, but that's <laughs> what they did. That, that night, uh, we had a heavy snowstorm, about a foot of snow, and in the morning, my mother woke up and decided that she was going to have a baby. Oh. <laughs> and so I began my DNA trip and, and my trip in this world yeah. uh, the day after Christmas wow. in Barkborough, Mass. And uh, an interesting thing, my birth certificate is signed by my grandfather because he was a town clerk. So uh, not many people have a birth certificate signed no. by their grandfather. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> um, so you arrived uh, uh, the day after Christmas. Oh, uh, yeah. And you were born, were you born in the truck or in a home? Oh, in, at the, in the farmhouse. Yeah. And they got the doctor to come over from that nearby town before they were through in case they needed a doctor for anything and apparently everything went all right. I have a baby book that gives d uh, every detail of my first mm -hmm. two years of life. I, s I saw it. that uh, yeah. earlier and that's quite a yeah. remarkable book. Yeah, but uh, after two years my father and mother uh, went separate ways. I was turned over to my mother's mother, my grandmother, mm. And I lived with them for um, about eight years, and their home was in Somerville. So I became a city boy mm -hmm. beginning in, in when I was uh, two years old. Oh, okay. And uh, later on, I'll get into the fact that after that, when I was 12, I became a country boy, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, city of Somerville had some very interesting things. One of the things that uh, stuck in my mind was that at the end of our street was a fire station. Hmm. So many times I would see the fire engines and they were first pulled by horses, pulled out of the firehouse with the with the um, fire going, sparks flying, to get the steam up on this. It was a steam engine that gave them that pumping power. And for a number of years they didn't have a truck or they didn't use a, a, a truck to get that out. And those horses, when they went, I was always impressed. They didn't trot or walk. They galloped. Wow. When they came out of that firehouse and hit the main street, they were trotting. Oh. Really, they moved that steam engine along. That's very dramatic very to fast. see. Mm. And it was pretty, not long after that, you couldn't find a horse-drawn steam engine yeah. anywhere. I knew, for instance, from looking in at the firehouse, that the harnesses uh, hung from the ceiling. And so when, when they got an alarm, those ceiling, those Harnesses dropped and somebody wow. lit the fire and, and they were off. Wow, <laughs> how about that? That was something that you can't see or know about now. No, no, I, very I different. I, to, to know that and have seen that, I, I felt uh, I had learned something. Yes, yes. Then, of course, uh, around the same corner was a, uh, on a convenience store where you could buy bread and milk and so forth. Mm. After school, which got out at 3.30, I could take a, a, a milk bottle to the store and get a nickel, ah, and yeah. then I could, I don't I won't say walk, we ran down to the center of town where they had a movie house, 
and I could see a whole movie for five cents. Wow, imagine that. Yeah, that, that, somebody, I was telling that to somebody else, and said, oh, I, I had to pay 10 cents. <laughs> 10 but cents. I, oh. I may be wrong. I <laughs> More think like $10 now. Yeah. Oh, and sure. I, I know, I think you had mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking that not only was there a movie, but there was also news, a newsreel that you would, you enjoyed while you were there. They would show a reel of silent news. They, they would show cowboy, uh, oh yeah, cowboy yeah. movies. They'd show Pathé News. Yeah. Which uh, interests everybody. And then it's mostly cowboy movies. Cowboy and there movies. were some cowboys in the movies then that were in it for many years after. As they got quite a bit older, they're still there. Yeah, yeah how about that? Right, yeah. So that. And uh, when, 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 you, when the piano player ah, came yeah. down the aisle, everybody threw their hats in the air, threw the tossed popcorn, yelled. That was a great event when the piano player finally arrived to play the piano. Wow. I don't know why, but that was a high moment. Yeah, yeah. Gets a crowd cheering. Uh, that, we don't see that anymore. No. But no, uh, I, I know from talking with you, you've had connection to piano uh, through your life, not playing it so much, a little bit. But uh, I, I remember you saying how much you liked the piano person coming out and cheering up the crowd. Um, so uh, you made the most. I think that is uh, something that I hear from your stories. Maybe. This, um, and you, I know you had mentioned you grew up without electricity, right? It, uh, well, uh, when I, 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 I moved from Somerville to Boxborough to live with my great aunt when I was 12 years old, and then I lived from the time I was 12 until the time I was uh, well, about 16. I lived in a, in a, a very uh, sparse environment. Uh, we had no electricity. We, we had no running water. We, we, had, uh, we ha only had kerosene lamps, and we didn't have any refrigeration. So, you know, when you bought a piece of meat, we eat, ate it the same day yeah. and things like that. But... Um, I, I, I wasn't unhappy that everybody else lived the same way. Everyone did, and you got and by. Some people might wonder, how can you possibly exist yeah, without electricity? You know, say, what about your milk? I said, well, we used to go to the next farm. Every, every night we went to the next farm, got a quart of milk right out from the cow. Wow. And what we didn't use at night, we put in a pail of water and put that pail down cellar, and that was there for breakfast. And it would last. I, I, I might say, all, all our, we had to cook all of our food on a Glenwood stove made for coal, but we never burnt coal in it. We had to build a wood fire. Every single morning that I lived there, we had to build a wood fire in order to make coffee, and in order to get the food ready. All our cooking, and we made our homemade bread, well. all made on that Glenwood with, with wood and not coal. I don't know how, how they about did that? it. Yeah. And I want to tell you that toast, made on top of a Glenwood stove, burning wood, has a different flavor than any toaster made. Yeah. I don't know why, but it gets some of the flavor of the wood in that toast. And did you like that? Oh, I miss it. Oh, I, miss it. Yeah. I tried to burn, oh. make toast on a wood stove here. No, <laughs> it didn't not work. the same. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's a good memory, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah. And I, I still miss it. it yeah. And then, uh, um, bu I got my first taste of busing there. Uh, living in a rural area, we were taken by bus to the grammar school yeah. and taken by bus to high school. And I was the first one on the bus and the last one on the bus in the afternoon. So I got a lot of, I got, I got a lot of busing, but mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't mind. But that bus, the owner filled his radiator with kerosene. He wouldn't put alcohol in it because the alcohol boiled off and he kept losing alcohol. And I want to tell you, I can smell that kerosene. Mm. In, it was in that bus even now. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. I don't know how yeah. he got away with it. It didn't seem to hurt the car. Ha-ha, uh -huh. yeah. Well, but it never froze. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. I know you were talking also uh, that it's a very different from what, you, what was normal back in the day that all of the people would come to the home to sell Food oh yeah. Well, while I was still in Somerville, there were some other things that were noticeable. And in, in the in the city, well, in the country, it happened too. The the uh, uh, clerk from the grocery store would come and get your order, and then deliver it in the afternoon. 
that happened both in uh, mm. Boxborough mm -hmm. and but that when you think about it only a few people had cars and so uh, unless they did that all those people couldn't walk to the grocery right, store right. No, the women the women uh, stayed home there was no car for the women to drive down to the grocery yeah. store women didn't work in the uh, when I first uh, went to school mm -hmm. they stayed home and that that was why I think uh, kids that grew up w when the women were staying home. That's why we were so much better than the people are now. I have to brag a little bit. You know. How is that? Um, <laughs> oh, that well, somebody was at home yeah, with the kid, children? Kids that, are, uh -huh. kids that are taken care of by babysitters don't seem to behave the same way as when the mother was home all the time to take care of them. Uh -huh. But that's, that's a personal... Uh, right, you know, or yeah. or perhaps a father. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, um, well, that's a, yeah, that's another TV show, maybe, but yeah. Uh, yeah, there's so much to talk about. I know one of the things I wanted to ask you this time about, if you could, I, if you could tell about some of the most important moments of your life that you can recall now in your in your years of 103, looking back, what would you say they, which moments in time would you well, say? Well, I, I think that uh, l living through a hurricane period or a hurricane storm, yeah. and also living in temperatures that are 20 below zero, Ooh, yeah. which occasionally <laughs> some winters would happen for oh. a week at a time. You know, Pretty hard to start an old Model T Ford when there's 20 below zero. Oh, but yeah. we did it. Wow. <laughs> That's a good, good for people to know these days, right? It, we can survive if it goes that low. Yeah. We had to jack up the rear wheels because the grease is hot. And then turn over, and the rear wheels would spin. And then the trick was to get the wheels on the ground without being run over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have a story also. Uh, that you had mentioned uh, in being witness uh, to a murder, in a way, right? Uh, when you were on a farm, and it, it's just more of the whole story of being uh, resilient that you saw um, some uh, young adults using guns and thinking that there weren't any bullets, uh, so that they were playing with guns, in a way, right? And it resulted in... Um, and someone getting killed. Oh, yes. Yes, and, it, and that's the same theme we deal with now in a way, but... Yeah, uh, well, that was a pretty... Uh, well, I lived through it, and I think the shock came afterwards. I, I did. I, I, after I uh, got out of college, I didn't only went a year, I, I, I started an egg route in Somerville and Brookline. I yeah. sold eggs and poultry, and I was at that farm buying eggs. And that farm was only a short distance away from me. And I was standing by the front door. And uh, the, the, um, the, the son of the owner was standing there with me. And the hired man was upstairs playing the harmonica. Mm. And he looked out and he said, if you, if you don't stop playing that harmonica, I'll shoot you. Mm. In fun. He was kidding. But then he picked up a gun, by, which was by the front door. We always kept guns by the front door so yeah. we could kill the animals easy. He picked up the gun and he pulled the trigger and it fired. N nobody realized there was a bullet in that gun. Yeah. And so sad, very the sad. kid got shot right at the head of the stairs. Oof. And because we couldn't get a doctor quick enough, he bled to death. Oh. And uh, you know, it was a, it was a shock. Yeah. It took, and of course the kid that did it was, he, he out of his mind, he didn't mean yeah. to do that. Sure, he went of off course. and he had, took quite a while before we could find him. Uh, but he wasn't charged with yeah. any, any crime. But obviously had a big impact in your but life. You, you know, how many times I picked up the paper since then and said, yeah. they didn't know the gun was loaded. Yeah. You see yeah. that every year, they didn't know the gun was loaded. But, and, and, and the farmer that owned the guns, he knew better than to leave a loaded gun there, but they just got callous and yeah. they left it loaded. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah, yes. that taught me a lesson that, hey, anything that shouldn't happen like that it can happen that's right yeah and yeah uh, it's important to keep hearing that throughout life 
Uh, All right, what else uh, for important moments in life? Well, I almost got run over by a freight, by a freight train. Oh, yeah. well, that's pretty significant. <laughs> <laughs> when I was about eight years old, we were downtown shopping with, with my aunt, and we had to, the gates were down. We had to wait for the train to go by. Mm -hmm. And then after it went by, uh, you know, y young kids, they don't wait for the gates to go up. They dive under the gates and they go across. So I, I dived under the gates and I was going to cross. I was oh. going to wait for the gates. Oh, boy. I got in the middle of the track and I looked up and there's the locomotive. Come oh on the other way. Oh, my goodness. Wow. What did you do? Oh, boy. I just kept running. <laughs> I don't know how I got ahead of the locomotive. Yeah. I don't know. Wow. And you got off the tracks. Oh, I flew off. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like a little bit of a uh, uh, you know, mystery. The fact that two trains would pass each other yeah. at that same one point was, was very unordinary. Un yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But you made it and you survived and another lesson learned maybe. And I know you wanted to talk about meeting your wife uh, as a, one of the most important moments of, of your life and being married, beginning that part of your life. Yeah, uh, I, I um, it was, of course, getting married was very important to me too. Because as I went to other people's houses, I said, gee, I don't want to live like that or, or make some comment. And, and my, I had a customer on my A group who wanted to give me, she says, I hear you're getting married. Mm. She said, I want to give you a piece of advice, she said. Marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. It's 60-60, ah. and I never forgot it. Ah. I, I think today it's 100-100. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's anyway, a good way to look at it. Yeah, things like that. I finally uh, drifted into factory work. Um, uh, a friend of mine got me a job in the factory just, just at the beginning of the Depression. So I worked all through the Depression and I had food to eat. I, I, at least I had, a, I had a job. How could you get work during the Depression? Many people were without jobs. How did, what? How did you get work? in those years of the depression. How did I get work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I had a, a friend that worked in the factory and they knew there was an opening there mm. and they spoke up for me. So and, they looked out. And yeah. it's like, you know, isn't that the way people get good jobs through an inside tip from some well, friend somewhere? Well, uh-huh, it can help. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I learned uh, to spray paint and to stain furniture. That's right. And you I, started I, with piano benches. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, they had a piano factory there in the, in the nec next town, to, and uh, and you painted I, them. I stayed on that for about four years, and then I did a foolish thing. I, I I had an argument with my boss, and I quit the job. But I I saw an ad from a General Electric company. They wanted a sprayer, and so I got right over there, and uh, I thought I'd get the job, but then they well, you know, you've been spraying on wood, and this job is spraying on metal, and I, so I don't, I'm not sure we, we could use you. I got my hand on the door to go out, and said, well, well may, may, maybe, maybe we'll try it. I guess they had a hard job to find one, hmm. and so they hired me finally, but I was only hired for six weeks. That was a rush season for selling clock, making clock, six weeks. So at the end of six weeks, I'm hanging by my fingernails. Are they gonna, do I get another week? Am I through? Yeah. I kept asking, no, another week. I, I worked there 12 years finally. Wow, wow. <laughs> and I know you you advanced in your position. Yeah, I, I, uh, I kept going. I went to co college nights to get some more tr uh, education. And uh, it wasn't too expensive then. And. Um, they, uh, the company posted a notice that they wanted to train a time study man. So I applied for it and eventually I got it. Mm. But when I took it, it was a tough decision because it meant a cut in pay. Before I applied for that, I was on piecework and I was well, the highest piecework in the department. I made a lot of money piecework. So my wife said, well, it, it probably, you should, you should probably take it. So I, I did take it. And then it wasn't long before I got my got more money back, and then before I left the company, I was a supervisor of the spray department, mm. 
and uh, had had half a dozen people work, working under me. And then when they opened up a plant in Lowell during the wartime, I was in charge of that. And then they opened up a plant in Worcester, and I was in, in charge. So anything outside of Ashland that had to do with the work measurement, I was in charge of it. Mm. And so it shows in those days you could get it and you could advance. I, I don't think that's very true today. But you invested yourself and you made the most of a situation which wasn't quite what you had in mind, but you kept working at it and you did, in yeah. fact, do very well. And you also made your dream come true, which was to own a home. I, you had mentioned having a home was your important oh, yeah. goal in yeah. life. Uh, well, uh, I shouldn't have got married. I had fifty dollars in the bank, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, my, my bride had just, or my girlfriend had just graduated from uh, high school. I, I went with her for five years. Now, every year I had to have a chaperone. Five years. That's a long time. I got see so one. When they, her family said, well, okay, when, when uh, she graduates from high school, then you don't have to have a chaperone. So they kept their word. We, we went out, no, no chaperone. About the third time out, we came back about half past nine, I guess. We didn't think it was late. Oh, if you're going to stay out this late, her sister says, you'll have to get married. And, okay, we'll, we will. And, and of course, I held it to us. Oh, we'll get married. We got married. We made him arrange to get married right then and there. Yeah. How about <laughs> that? Well, she helped. That uh, was not a mature decision. <laughs> well, sometimes it works out that way. And how many years were well, you, you know, married? Yeah, 80, 80, I think 80, uh, 82, 70, about 78 years. Woohoo! Yeah. Wow. And uh, you, you. Having a home was very important to you because you said you moved 19 times in your earlier years, yeah. and, and you, you know, made that happen. I had good homes when I shifted around, but yeah. it just it, 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 it like to feel that when you go go there and open the door, that it's your your home, yes. not somebody else's family. Anymore. And I understand you built two of your own homes, in fact. I I did. I I uh, well, I moved in with my great aunt, but then we rented rented a house next door. And, and we had an, a place of our own. Wow, that's and it was very nice. And of course, w I had very little money. We didn't have very. Sometimes we we had apple pie for breakfast because we had free apples. We had uh -huh. all the apples we wanted free because we lived across from an apple farm. So, but, but uh, again, making the most of what you oh, had yeah. to get by. Right, right. I know uh, one of the things uh, we had talked about earlier were some of the guiding philosophies of your life. People often ask, what's the secret of living so long? And you say, it's DNA for you. But you also have some very particular philosophies that have, <laughs> you feel, it seems, that have guided you, like not being bored. Yeah. And my wife wanted a home as much as I did. She was one of 11 children, and she was almost the youngest one. So she was nearly the bottom of the ladder. And, she, she, and her family was extremely poor. Yeah. So even though we got married on nothing, there was no change for her. She'd been no. that, living that way all her life. Yeah. And you worked as a team. And yeah. I, I know that you said uh, some of the philosophies that you have followed are saving money is important, um, never being bored in life, never saying, I'm bored, I don't know what to do, yeah. always finding something to do and um, that you work out problems. You don't just give up is something that was important to you in life. When you uh, have it, a problem, you go through. Yeah, if the problems were important, I know later in life we, we had a number of uh, bugs or VW cars, and I got poor service in the garage. Right? So I, I got the tools I needed and for years after that, I rebuilt my motors on my VWs. Oh, I never uh -huh. went to back to the garage again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At different levels, you figure out the problems in your life, yeah. including your car engines. That's right. pretty right. impressive. Yeah. So, uh, any other uh, important philosophy or advice how to live a good life? Well, <laughs> I, I think that 
that that can be very difficult if you're so unfortunate as to as to not make a good marriage. I don't know what I could tell you. Mm. I really don't know whether you, I, I say stick with it or dissolve it. But other than that, um, um, this, like you mentioned before, if we if we didn't have the money to buy something, we didn't buy it. We yeah. never got yeah. into debt, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we pretty much tried to mind our own business. You know, like my wife was not a nosy person, and. Uh, and uh, as along the way, I think, we realized that we both were lucky. We could have made a, a poorer marriage than we, than we did. It seemed you focused on your family. Yeah. Along, along with some of the good days that I didn't mention earlier, yeah. I just I remember the day we got our first new car. Uh, that was a, that that was was a big, big day. What that kind of car day. was it? It was a Ford. It was a Ford. Okay. Yeah, right about that. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned one thing that's been remarkable for you recently is you have had some very serious uh, encounters with health, two heart attacks and pneumonia where you thought that was surely the end of your life, but you came back around uh, and your health improved and uh, still here you are now. Um, and you said in a way that seems a little bit of a mystery of life that you thought for sure you would not let you would not be living now um, uh, yet here you are and you are doing you're healthy and uh, uh, I, it, it, is, it is remarkable yeah. unless you realize that that's one of the functions of DNA is how many of these uh, helpful characters that are built into you yeah. built into your body yes and uh, I I, I, I suppose I, I shouldn't complain about it, but when I had my second heart attack, it was very painful, very painful. And I said, it's all right, I don't have to do this again. This is the last time. Mm. And I recovered. I said, oh, I was upset that I recovered. Yeah. Because I'm going to have to do it again uh -huh. sometime. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But, uh, uh, yeah, but. It, it, worked out, it worked out well. Here you yeah. are. And you have. Uh, uh, I might mention one thing yeah. if there's any time left. Yes. The, the people that uh, have a hospital, ho ho the hospice organization, have done a lot of work. They send the doctors out to give me a bath, uh, to check me. A regular doctor checks me once a week. And they, they, they do so many things for us to make it easy for me now to live that they, they deserve a lot of credit. They and, do a and great they don't job. Charge us any, 